Hello, everyone. Happy Wednesday, March 6, and welcome to The Final Bar. I'm your host, Dave Keller. I'm the chief market strategist here at StockCharts.com in a sunny but quite cold Redmond, Washington. Thanks for joining us every weekday after the close as we try to make sense of these markets with you using the toolkit of the technical analysts. The technical analysis toolkit really is designed to help you understand what's happening by focusing on price. Price is what's most important. So we can talk about breadth conditions, which we will today. We'll do a segment called Banking on Breadth. We'll check in some of the uh, market breadth conditions. We can talk about sentiment, looking at volatility, put call ratios, uh, survey data, and everything else. All of that, I would argue, is very much secondary to price action, right? The most important measure we can uh, bring to bear to understand investor psychology and understand that interplay between fear and greed that really drive asset prices, it's about price. And that's what technical analysts of, uh, of decades uh, past have certainly focused on. We'll continue to, uh, to shout that message as much as we can. Sort of an interesting choppy day here. The major averages all finished in the green. Volatility actually uh, sort of flat from yesterday. So a lot of charts to review. And again, we'll focus a little bit on breadth conditions because overall, I would argue breadth actually quite strong. And that's not because the mega cap growth stocks are working so well. Some of them are not. It's actually because of all the other things, industrials, defensive sectors like utilities and staples starting to come under their own a little bit. With that in mind, let's get to our market recap and see how the charts actually played out since yesterday's close. Before we get to the charts, I do want to share a uh, poll question that we had recently asking you, where will Bitcoin be on March 31st, 2024? Let's bring out our crystal ball and think about where Bitcoin may end the month of March. And I asked you above 60,000, 57% of you. I should have upped this a little bit. What's funny is I actually set this question up a couple of weeks ago at a time when it didn't seem likely that it seemed like 60K would be sort of a nice upper threshold. Boy, how things have changed in just a week or two, right? Uh, so 57% of you saying above 60K. What's interesting is I was wondering when I had a pretty low measure of 50,000, how many of you would be pretty bearish thinking that this exponential rise would be given back and we'd have sort of a vertical drop uh, over the next three to four weeks. Uh, almost a quarter of you actually agreed with that, uh, with that assessment. You know, we're going to look at the chart of Bitcoin in a little more detail, uh, hopefully through the course of the show. But, you know, when you think about Bitcoin uh, right now, it's actually on my intermarket analysis chart list. Here we go. When you're thinking of the chart of Bitcoin, it, this is a challenging chart. And I would say there are a lot of challenging charts. And what I mean by challenging charts is there, you know, a lot of times charts are in sort of that normal phase, right? When I think about like Bitcoin kind of November of 23, not that it's ever easy, but it certainly seemed like it was a pretty compelling uh, chart in that we'd been in a basing pattern after a rally. We'd certainly hit a pause, about a six month, eight month pause in the trend, and then had broken to new highs. Certainly seemed likely that we would see further upside potential. But now all of a sudden we've had a number of rallies, had a number of pullbacks, and now we've really accelerated. And the last two, uh, two months or so have been almost, uh, I mean, straight up for, for Bitcoin. We're now testing all time highs uh, right around 69,000. Now, just in the 48 hours since we've tested all time highs, and that's going back to the left side of this chart in the fourth quarter of 2021. Now that we've retested those uh, highs, what happens? Well, I'll tell you what's happening is extreme volatility, which is really the nature of cryptocurrencies. They are much more volatile than uh, stocks or ETFs and certainly have upside potential, I mean, at least in recent history, uh, far outpacing uh, equity. So think of it as like a leveraged play on, on speculation, uh, given the, uh, the volatility and given the extreme uh, movements. But where does that leave us? I would say, you know, I was told when in doubt, zoom out. So I think taking a step back, really thinking of the larger structure, which even though we're way over our skis, arguably, uh, you know, and even if we do get more of a pullback, which is certainly possible, you know, is the long-term trend still constructive? I would argue it probably is. Um, and, and I would say, you know, highly likely we break above 70,000 to go further. You know, Bitcoin ETFs being approved or what happened here, that caused that pullback in January, but uh, sort of December to January. But then from there, we really accelerated back to, uh, to the upside and now have continued that uptrend. So I think that initial uncertainty after the ETFs were finally approved now has been resolved in a clearly bullish outcome. The next big fundamental, for lack of a better term, thing on Bitcoin is Bitcoin halving, which happens sort of in the April-ish time frame. I haven't looked for an updated uh, date on when exactly that's going to happen. It's a bit of a moving target. But if you look back at the history of Bitcoin, 100% of the time, it's been a bullish, uh, you know, a bullish signal for, for Bitcoin because it usually means we've reached this new level and we now have to change the structure and, uh, and have the value. So overall, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, overall, you know, sort of, sort of gives a bullish 
framework to the uh, to the chart and a bullish framework to the fundamental story. So I see there could be uh, could be further upside there. So thanks so much for answering that poll. By the way, don't forget to follow us on social media outlets like uh, X and uh, and elsewhere, and uh, and also make sure you uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. You won't miss the next poll. With that in mind, let's keep going here with our market recap. The major averages all in the green. As a matter of fact, everything's in green here. Volatility was slightly negative, but actually uh, finished today just re really around where it was yesterday, uh, around 14 and a half on the VIX. So still, by my basic definition of 15 being the bogey, uh, we're kind of right there. And yesterday on a Tuesday session, we did trade briefly above a VIX level of 15 and came back down today, uh, did not quite get above there. So overall, still, I would say, loosely classified as a low volatility environment. I have an alert, which I've now re-enabled uh, for when the VIX goes above 15. I would encourage you to do the same. Not that that is the uh, major sell signal we may be waiting for, but certainly tells you that we are exiting what you could probably describe as a low volatility environment into something else. Uh, having said that, today, the major average is higher. The S&P up about half a percent. Closing the day just above 5,100, it was as high as around 5,125 uh, around lunchtime, Eastern time, settled back down uh, into the close, uh, but the, uh, the, the strength had been processed. We're at 51, over 5,100 now. The NASDAQ composite around 16,030, and that's up 0.6% from yesterday's close. Mid caps and small caps up as well. The S&P 600 small cap index, the worst performer of the three, but still up uh, almost a third of a percent. The S&P 600 getting just above uh, 1,300. Continuing our discussion through other asset classes, interest rates continue to come down. You have Powell's um, uh, presentation, I guess, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, to, uh, to Congress uh, this week. Uh, and overall, market you know, risk assets uh, clearly moving higher today uh, based on his comments. Rates coming down here, so the 10-year yield getting closer to 4%. Finished today around 4.1%, five-year point just slightly above that. And the long bond uh, a little further up, about four and a quarter. The short end of the curve, of course, which is more tied to the Fed funds target rate, still above 5%. And so lowering the way that a yield curve could normalize, it's one of two things or a combination of both, right? The short end of the curve comes down as the Fed lowers rates, uh, and that brings short-term rates down. The long end of the curve can kind of stay where it is, and that would kind of create a natural upward slope to the yield curve, which is what a healthy market environment usually looks like. Or the short end of the curve can remain relatively stable and uh, the long end of the curve goes up as there's renewed optimism about growth in the economy. Right now, we still have that inverted yield curve, uh, which, again, in general, has been a good, uh, good uh, predictor of uh, recessionary periods. You know, again, I, I'm hearing a lot of discussion about how we may have already had a recession. Maybe it's a different type of recession. It's a recession that looks a different way. Uh, all sorts of ways of, uh, of sort of talking out of uh, the fact that we are, uh, you know, looking for a big recession that's going to uh, really cripple asset prices through the course of 2024. I, you know, again, I, I uh, coming back from Dubai and hearing a number of the presenters, a couple of them mentioned how recessions as a label for a technical analyst, not particularly valuable, right? Recessions are really talking about economic data. Economic data has a serious lag. So you're really only able to confirm a recession months later when you can look back and think about previous quarters and what that might meant. When we're looking at the stock market itself, it's one of the best predictors of the economy, right? So the stock market tends to lead the economy because optimism and economic growth tends to be priced into stocks before the economic data actually starts to improve. So the best thing you could do, I would argue, is, uh, is focus on stocks and asset prices and uh, see where they're headed. For now, they still appear to be headed higher. Bonds, of course, moving higher as well, and that's what happens when rates are going down. That means bond prices are going up, and the TLT was up about 0.6%. Dollar index down about a third of a percent from yesterday's close. We've talked about sort of that choppy sideways experience of the commodity space here recently. Uh, the DBC was up about 0.8 percent uh, today. Gold prices and silver prices all in the green as well. Silver leading the way higher, almost 2 percent uh, to the upside. Crude oil prices uh, moving higher as well. Finally, cryptocurrencies after a lot of red yesterday, sort of that big drawdown after uh, testing all time highs around 69 K. Uh, we have, uh, have recovered a bit of that, uh, for currently right around uh, just below 67,000, we'll call it 66,660. Uh, Ether price is just below 4,000, and that's up about 8.5% from yesterday. You can see all 10 of the most liquid coins that we track on our platform are all in the green. Looking at the sector summary and the 11 S&P sectors and where they're at, you will see that, uh, let's see, utilities up point, uh, sorry, 1%, consumer staples up 0.8 percent. So what I'm immediately drawn to when I'm looking at this, thinking about my conversation yesterday with Julius DeCampaner, a lot of fun to bring him on 
and uh, think about rotations, looking at different RRGs. And if you missed that, make sure you go back, uh, treat yourself to that discussion because we talked about looking at the regular S&P sectors, those 11 sectors, but also the equal weighted sectors. This is one of those times where actually there's a very different message at times. Communication services is one of those sectors in particular where the cap weighted and equal weighted versions have very different views right now because the mega cap uh, names in that sector are doing something different than the rest of those. So make sure you review that uh, interview if you missed it. That was on yesterday's show on Tuesday. But we also talked about looking for signs of deterioration uh, for the broad market by looking for strength in defensive sectors. And to me, that uh, brings three sectors to mind, utilities, uh, consumer staples, and real estate. And when you see those sectors doing well, particularly on a relative basis, that often indicates uh, that conditions are starting to get uh, less optimal. Today, utilities and consumer staples, your top two sectors, both up about 0.8 to 1%. Technology was number three, up 0.8%, and you're continuing to see strength in semiconductors uh, as they uh, continue to push to the upside. On the downside, only one of the 11 S&P sectors finished in the red, the consumer discretionary sector, XLY. Tesla, one of the biggest weights, is breaking down through support as we speak here uh, this week. Uh, just the latest uh, down move uh, within a corrective period, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, down almost 0.4% today. Communication services was number two, and energy number three from the bottom, both up slightly uh, from Tuesday's close. Looking at what we call the Magnificent Seven and Friends, some of those mega cap uh, growth names you can see NVIDIA, Meta, uh, their top two leaders, both up, let's see, NVIDIA up over 3%. Again, semiconductors continuing to move to the upside. Meta number two up 1.2%. On the downside, you see Tesla down to 2.3%. Uh, Alphabet and Apple rounding out uh, the worst performers within that group of uh, mega cap growth stocks. Let's go to a daily chart of the S&P 500 and see how today's move, again, slightly higher, how that fits into the medium term and long term trends. So what's interesting about uh, the uh, daily chart of the S&P 500, are we still going up? Um, I would say yes, uh, it, but it depends on how you want to define that, right? It, the general way that I would think of uh, what I call the primary trend is looking at the trend, whatever chart you're looking at, look at the pattern of highs and lows, what jumps out at you. And if you were, you know, ask your eight year old son, Henry, which is what I would do, Draw me a line that tells you what this chart is doing. I'm pretty sure Henry would draw an upward sloping trend line right now. Whether or not he would exactly match this green line, I don't, I don't think so. But he would probably draw a line telling me, Daddy, the chart is going up. And I, I think he's right on this one. Um, and, and I think we can more clearly define that by the fact that we have higher highs and higher lows. right? And as long as that pattern continues, the trend is positive. Now, we are, are sort of lightening up the slope of that trend. And we can see that that's happened actually a couple times. right? The first trend line off the October low was broken in December. Now we have a second trend line connecting the October and the uh, January lows. I might need to adjust that one just slightly after the show to line it up better with these uh, lows here, but we're clearly breaking down below that trend line. I'm wondering if we may eventually draw a third trend line uh, to, uh, to sort of track this, uh, this upward, uh, upward slope. Uh, but worth noting that we uh, you know, certainly lowered uh, the, the, the slope of the uptrend uh, and now we're sort of sitting on this, uh, what I call a pivot point. A pivot point is one of those levels that serves as both support and resistance. That's kind of my general loose definition of a pivot point. Just an important price level that we've touched a number of ways uh, from multiple directions. Kind of tells you this price level has meaning. And it certainly seems to me that keeping an eye on where we're at relative to that, uh, that level uh, seems important. So on a very short term, kind of that tactical time frame, S&P above 50-50, uh, is still going higher because that's the most recent swing low. That's the low from uh, yesterday's session. It lines up from the lows from last week and also the high uh, from early February. If we would break that, if and only if, and that's where I would have my first price alert set, I'd be looking at the 50-day moving average and looking to see if and when we would break the 50-day because sort of my basic uh, sort of medium-term gauge, do we hold the 50-day moving average on a pullback? Uh, if we don't, that that means the medium-term trend is starting to be negative. The long-term trend for me would be more, are we breaking the 200-day moving average? So there you have sort of your short-term, medium-term, long-term using uh, price support and also moving average support as a way of just gauging the severity of the downtrend. So, you know, we haven't even triggered the initial sort of basic warning sign. And so, you know, what I like to do in an uptrend like this is keep pumping up that alert, right? Set an alert at 50-50, previous alerts would have been at 49-50 or other levels. And as we make a new high or low, sort of bump up that alert. And you're just looking to see if and when we break below there. Now the S&P and the NASDAQ, as we highlighted uh, on yesterday's show, 
uh, making a lower peak in momentum, right? So we're making higher highs here in early March, but on weaker momentum, right? So this is what's called a bearish momentum divergence. Now, the reason why I'm not shouting, oh my gosh, this is obviously the top because we have a bearish momentum divergence. This is not the first one. Now, the S&P really hasn't had a really clear uh, momentum divergence. Maybe this one back here, you could argue, was. Uh, but this is a pretty clear one, right? Where we're overbought on the initial new high. We're, uh, we're sort of right at that overbought region uh, on the uh, subsequent new high. So a clear downward slope to momentum as we're making new highs. I would say the QQQs uh, probably even more exaggerated. Yes, yeah, so you can see higher highs, January, February, March, lower peaks in momentum. This most recent uh, peak, we're not even above the uh, overbought, uh, overbought region. So I would say overall, you're seeing some divergences. Now it's all about price. Do we break the trends, right? So draw those trend lines and look, uh, set alerts for when we would actually uh, maybe break below there. Do want to talk briefly here about interest rates, of course, uh, as we get to uh, the Fed meeting coming up uh, here in a couple weeks, we'll have to talk a little bit more about the interest rate environment and what it means. It's worth noting that rates are turning lower, right? So bond prices are rallying. You're seeing rates coming down. Generally speaking, uh, you know, higher rates tend to be worse for, uh, worse for growth stocks, but you're actually seeing an inverse of that, right? You're actually seeing, you know, rates come down here in November, December, and growth was actually outperforming a little bit. Sorry, this is uh, value outperforming a little bit as rates come down. That's a bit of a head scratcher. Rates trending higher in the last couple months and growth outperforming. That's the opposite of what you would normally, uh, normally expect. And I think maybe a different narrative here. This is less rates impacting growth versus value. This is more the nature of what's happening. If people are rotating out of growth stocks and maybe rotating into bonds, that would mean bond prices going up, rates coming down, and growth stocks underperforming. I'm wondering if that's the combination we might be, uh, might be looking at here. Good reminder to just focus on all the different charts and uh, what levels we can identify. All right, let's hit on some of the individual names and groups uh, top of mind here. So consumer staples are one of the top performing sectors. Utilities were number one, staples number two. If you look, uh, uh, Kroger is one of the uh, food rate retailers, obviously a big uh, grocery store. Um, uh, common here, Kroger, uh, Kroger brands are pretty common here in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, although we don't have Kroger's, we have other, other uh, shops that are owned by Kroger and Albertsons, uh, breaking above 49 this week. And that's getting us above the high from May and August. So a nice rotation to new high. So I don't want to say that it's a great trading system, you know, in general, but I am always, when I see something like a grocery store making new highs, that's interesting to me in terms of a play on Kroger, but also a broader theme, which is, hold on a second, if we're that excited about owning Kroger, which I would describe as more of a defensive play, you know, what does that mean about the overall uh, environment? Other staples names are doing well uh, also. This is Church and Dwight CHD, which is in a group called Non-Durable Home Products, which is kind of a catch-all for a number of different uh, home goods, but you can see this one making a new 52-week closing high uh, this week, up about a half a percent. This isn't a perfect like uh, cup and handle pattern, but it certainly has that feel to it. Uh, and you're making a higher low, a pullback to the 50-day moving average before rotating higher. Um, so some of these staples names that have really not been particularly strong stocks and particularly strong sectors actually starting to show uh, signs of strength. I'm keen to see if the uh, relative strength starts to improve there. Number of stocks breaking out here uh, this week, and particularly today, Qualcomm, which is one of the many semiconductor stocks in a clear uptrend. Qualcomm's a little different than others in that I had this, uh, what I call an ascending triangle pattern. This is a consistent resistance level around 157 in mid-January to uh, mid-February. You can see the higher lows after a bounce off the 50-day first week in February. We break out of that pattern to the upside. That's a nice, strong breakout, and we're seeing additional follow-through uh, through the course of this week. So up a number 4%, uh, up a number f uh, another 4%, I mean. And the fact that the relative strength is making a new, you know, basically a new 12-month high today as well uh, is pretty encouraging. Semiconductors continue to be just a strong part of the market, while other areas like an Apple is pulling back, an Alphabet, a Tesla, you're not seeing that in the, uh, in the semiconductor space. These continue to be very strong, not showing any signs of a, of a pause just yet. Airbnb is another one making a new 52-week high today. So again, we can talk all we want about the uh, likelihood of a pullback in March, the seasonal weakness. At the end of the day, when stocks are breaking out, I'm going to be interested in those despite what I see or what I think about the market should do. Good breakouts are good breakouts. It's always a good time to own good charts is what I like to tell my uh, market misbehavior premium members. And I would say a chart like Airbnb is a great actionable uh, idea here. By the way, quick preview, we'll be doing our top 10 charts of March 2024, Grayson uh, Rose and I just sat down uh, this week 
to, uh, to uh, set up that discussion. And uh, Airbnb is, in fact, one of those top 10. Make sure you tune in on Friday's show to get the rest of the uh, top 10 and a little more uh, deeper discussion on what's attractive about some of these uh, compelling names. Coinbase is another one making a new high, up another 10% today. Now, Coinbase, of course, kind of a direct play on uh, cryptocurrencies. It was one of the top-ranked stocks in our large-cap scooter rankings. Uh, relative strength continuing to show uh, some upside. Just a couple names breaking down to uh, complete our market recap. Brown Foreman, I think this is a healthy reminder. I often quote Paul Tudor Jones, who said, nothing good happens below the 200-day moving average. This is a great reminder to be patient and wait for those breakouts to actually play. It's really tempting to buy a Brown Foreman here when it's breaking out above uh, previous resistance, when it's making a higher low. But just remember, this whole time, we've been below the 200-day moving average, which is clearly sloping downwards. Here we tested the December high and the 200-day. We have failed. We're down about 7-plus percent. And now back thinking about the previous lows and if we could find support. I wouldn't be surprised if we uh, continue this basing pattern and find more support here. But it certainly was a reminder to wait for that break of the 200-day moving average. Apple continuing to go lower, down about 0.6 percent today. I would say that October low very much in play. Would be very reasonable to expect support at 165. I have an alert for if and when Apple would break 165, and I would encourage you to do the same. And finally, Tesla, right? Let's keep in mind the Magnificent Seven becoming less and less of a group of stocks that actually look like they deserve to be in the same group. I am actively thinking about a new acronym for leading names, but for now, Tesla will certainly not be in that bucket of stocks because it has had a bear flag pattern now confirmed. I would say we're now breaking below the February low. See if we break that, and if so, I think that really measures a lot further, even below that April 23 low. Let's continue on our show here in a moment with a segment called Banking on Breath. This is a popular segment where we talk about breath conditions. Before we get though, just a reminder, the mailbag is always open. We've had such great, thoughtful questions from many of our viewers here in uh, recent months and indeed in, in recent years. And we'd love for uh, your question to be one of the next ones we feature on our show. Email is always best. The final bar at stockcharts.com. We're on X at final bar SCTV. So just tag us in a comment there. And here on YouTube, just drop a comment below the video that you're watching. Again, thanks all uh, your feedback, your support, but especially your uh, questions, which will help us uh, use our next mailbag segment coming up uh, very soon. Continuing today's show, Banking on Breadth. Again, this is a popular segment where we like to review some of the key market breadth indicators. And as I've mentioned many times, right, breadth has, or I guess market analysis has three steps. You have to start with price, right? And there's a reason why my Mindful Investor Live chart list, which is basically the morning coffee set of charts uh, that I look at, I kind of start here and then go off into a uh, hundred different directions based on what I've, uh, what I've seen. But I always start with the trend in the market, right? The first thing I try to assess is market trend, right? What is the trend on different time frames? And, and by any stretch of the imagination, the market trend is bullish, right? And that's not a judgment call, that's not an opinion. That is a factual assessment of the trend using a series of moving averages. Uh, we have a widget on our, uh, on our stock charts dashboard. Actually, I was just talking with the developers earlier today about uh, some upgrades, the 2.0 version of that widget, which will include dates and some other really cool stuff. So uh, hopefully that's just a starting point to a really cool visualization to help you, uh, you quantify this, uh, this, this market trend model. But the market trend is positive. But what next, right? So now we can start looking at different slices of the equity markets. We can also look at market breadth conditions. And in this segment, we're going to look a little bit at some of the market breadth charts that I review every day and just what they're telling us about the market environment. I did an interview earlier today uh, for, uh, for investing.com. We were talking about, um, you know, the conditions and I was asked about market breadth and, you know, the fact that, you know, the, uh, you know, cues had pulled back a little bit uh, yesterday for sure. Uh, the fact that we've already had such a run, are the breadth conditions as negative as they were, you know, earlier, like in January, breadth conditions started to look pretty, pretty weak. And I had to say, not really. And I think, uh, you know, from a single stock base, if you look at a scan for stocks making new highs, you'll find a bunch of stocks that look really good. I highlighted some of the consumer staple stocks in our market recap making a new three-month high. I'm finding a ton in industrials, in uh, healthcare, um, in uh, consumer discretionary, in financials. There are a bunch of stocks, uh, you know, breaking out, some of them early stages uh, in their breakout. And so, Breadth conditions really measure that broad participation, right? So when you think of Apple and Alphabet and Tesla breaking down, that is more of a localized issue with a, a series of growth stocks 
that have already had ridiculous runs last year and certainly well overdue for a pullback. I would argue many other growth stocks probably are overdue for a pullback as well. But you're seeing a lot of other stocks starting to emerge in a position of strength. And that means the breadth conditions remain quite strong. This is the first breadth chart we're going to look at. It's the S&P 500 on the top and then the breadth in four different universes of stocks. We have the New York Stock Exchange, which is my favorite measure of, uh, of, of breadth using the advanced decline data because it's a pretty broad group of stocks, uh, different sectors, different styles and uh, market cap tiers involved. And then we have large cap, mid cap, small cap, just to try to understand a little bit more about leadership themes within the types of companies and the sizes of stocks and uh, what's getting it done. Note that the NYSE's advanced decline line did in indeed make a new 52 week high again in the last week. So when the market's making a new high, but the advanced decline lines are not, that's a bit of a warning sign. That's why in late January, I was telling you, all right, potential divergence here, because the S&P is breaking up, but the uh, breadth data is not confirming it. What you have to look for is one of two things happen. Either the breadth data resumes its uptrend to catch up, uh, I guess, for lack of a better term, to the market uptrend, meaning more and more stocks are participating in the uptrend, or the price of the S&P or whatever benchmark you're looking at trades lower and sort of shows you the lack of breadth is dragging the market down. And the former, the first thing that I, first scenario that I described is what actually played out. In the six weeks after that late January observation, you've actually seen the breadth conditions improve. The S&P's continued higher, the NASDAQ has made new all-time highs, and the New York Stock Exchange advanced decline line is improving. So when the s and is making a new high and the NYSE AD line is making a new high, that's just not bearish. There might be other things that tell us that the market may turn lower, but it's not this chart. This chart is actually quite supportive of further upside here. The large cap AD line and the mid cap AD line are all confirming that market uptrend that we've now uh, uh, described as uh, based on the weight of the evidence. The small cap AD line is the only thing that is uh, that is not. And so, you know, again, reminder that uh, while the uh, mega cap names are working, while a lot of other large and mid cap stocks are certainly working, generally speaking, small caps are not as strong as those other cap tiers. So large over small has been the story here for the last 12, 18 months, continues to be the story here in early days of 2024, as small caps are underperforming, uh, clearly so. The McClellan Oscillator, boy, I'm so annoyed by this chart, I'll be honest with you. I don't, I don't get annoyed that easily, but this chart is, uh, is bugging me. And the reason is because there are times when this chart gives clear buy and sell signals, meaning clear bullish and bearish uh, uh, signals when we go above the zero line or below the zero line. The last couple months have just been noisy, right? And so we'll spend a day or two above the zero line and then go back below. We'll spend a day or so below and then we go back above. And literally for the last six weeks, that's pretty much what has happened with some uh, rare exceptions. Overall, it's just been chopping above and below the zero line. So I'm uh, and I would say today, this is an updated depth for today's close. But given what happened uh, with most stocks uh, going higher, I would expect the McClellan Oscillator to go back above zero at the close today. So I didn't change the uh, color coding to uh, bearish red just yet. I would say overall, the McClellan Oscillator, if there was a neutral setting, I would probably color it neutral. But uh, at this point, uh, technically bullish because uh, we just had one day below the zero line before popping up. So overall, what this tells you, even though we have these little noisy kind of pullbacks, the uh, the primary or, or certainly the short term trend as defined by this short term breadth measure uh, is still bullish. Now, one of the uh, observations I like to make in a bullish phase is looking at this chart here. This is the uh, number of stocks making new 52 week highs and lows. And if you've not seen this set of charts, just so we're all uh, on the same page here. Here's the S&P 500 daily open high low close going back for the last 12 months. This is the net difference every day of new 52 week highs minus new 52 week lows on the New York Stock Exchange. The next panel down is the uh, in green, the new 52 week highs in red, the new 52 week lows uh, on the uh, on the NYSE. And then at the bottom, uh, we have uh, new 52 week highs in the S&P 500 and new 52-week lows in the S&P 500, again, uh, highs in green and lows in red. So a couple ways that we like to use this chart. Number one, look at the difference between net new highs and net new lows. Uh, because what this tells you is basically just how many going up versus how many going down. And again, not just advancers, decliners, but you know, making new, new highs and lows. So it's more of a, a tougher threshold to reach. And if the histogram is consistently in the black, that means that generally speaking, way more new highs than new lows. That's pretty classic. Uh, characteristic of an uptrend. So you can see from mid-November to where we're at today, that has certainly been the story. If you look at mid-August of last year through the October low, you can see the opposite, right? Uh, more, not uh, No real black bars and a lot of red. And what that means is on average, you have way more new 52-week lows 
that new 52-week high. So we are clearly looking much more similar to what we would look like in a bullish phase. And that that kind of makes sense. Now, here we're looking at a little uh, different groups of stocks and just trying to uh, assess new 52-week highs and lows. The more green you see here, those are uh, stocks making new 52-week highs, limited amount of red, and those are the new 52-week lows. So overall, these are clearly all, all, uh, all bullishly aligned here. Um, you know, more new highs than new lows, and obviously a lot of green and very little red. So the reason why I think this chart is helpful is because what I like to think about is, what's the trend? So the trend is clearly positive. What would tell you that that trend is changing? What I like to call a change of character. That would mean uh, less black and more red in this first panel down, less green and a lot more red in the second panel, less green, a lot more red in the, in the bottom panel. Because that, what that would indicate altogether is that you're seeing very, very few new 52-week highs. We're starting to see a lot more new 52-week lows. And a lot of times this indicator at the top will start to change first because even though there still could be some stocks continuing to go higher, and I would expect, given what we're seeing here, I wouldn't be surprised if that's like mega cap growth names uh, like Meta, if it's uh, semiconductor stocks like NVIDIA and Qualcomm, just in these resilient uptrends that even if other things go down, I feel like people are still going to want to own Qualcomm because it just seems like it's a good place to be. If you're so um, you know, nervous about the markets that you're selling your Qualcomm holding, that's when this indicator starts going uh, to the red uh, across the board. And that would tell you that those leadership names are starting to pull back. Things that are early uh, droppers like Tesla and Apple really continue to go to the downside. That would mean a lot more red on here. So at this point, clearly bullish, more red on this chart, and less green and black would tell you that things are getting uh, less bullish. You know, it's worth noting breadth on multiple time frames, and really anything on multiple time frames is uh, is really valuable. Uh, and and again, for you know sake of time on uh, on the final bar, we rarely get into multiple time frame analysis. If I was managing my own portfolio and sharing you an over the shoulder view at what I'm doing, you'll notice a lot more thinking about multiple time frames. And I do this to some degree with the market trend model. I think you want to think about tactical moves, cyclical moves, and secular moves, right? Short-term, medium-term, long-term, and, and don't, you know, make sure you stay in your lane, right? Don't think about a one-day move as a long-term change. That's, by definition, a short-term change, but a series of daily moves become a medium-trend move, and then, a, and then a series of medium-trend changes become a long-term trend, uh, right? And, and so that's why the hourly and daily charts will, will be more sensitive and will catch a move before the weekly and monthly charts would register that something more significant is happening. I think you can do that same thing with breadth data. So here we have the percent of stocks above their 50-day. Uh, some of my guests, I'm thinking of like Tony Dwyer, who I'll hopefully see. I'm going to New York next week. Hopefully we'll be able to catch up with Tony and others in the, uh, in the area there. Um, when I talk with Tony, he actually looks at the percent of stocks above their 10-day moving average as a very short-term gauge of just mean reversion, right? Because when that gets up to like 90% above their 10-day, that often means we get a brief pullback. You get 90% below their 10-day, that often means a bit of a bounce up. So that's more of that tactical time frame. The medium-term time frame for me is this bottom series, which is the percent of stocks above their 50-day moving average. It's worth noting that even with that sort of choppy period in, uh, mid, into mid-February, when the breadth data was getting a lot worse as the S&P was going higher, we still never got below 50%. So that told you that it was really more of a rotational thing, really wasn't a broad uh, concerning issue. Now, the long-term measure of breadth, uh, as I would define it here, would be the percent of stocks above their 200-day moving average. And let's remember that even in the weakest part, uh, weakest observation here in the last uh, really year to date, we're still around 69%, 70% of S&P stocks above their 200-day. So, you know, while the S&P has remained well above its 50-day and well above its 200-day, most stocks are in that same bucket, right? Very few stocks uh, and that's not saying, I mean, I mean, over half of stocks have remained above their 50-day moving average, even with any choppiness here uh, in the early days of 2024. And, and very few stocks have broken below their 200-day moving average. It was 80% at the end of last year. It got down around 69%. So what, 10% of the S&P uh, broke below their 200-day, but most of them uh, still very much above there. Watching this to see a break below the 50% level uh, would be a, a sign of, uh, of really more of a retracement, uh, more of a corrective move. This indicator getting below 50% would be the, uh-oh, you really need to get defensive indicator. Again, we're nowhere near those levels. We're still very much in a bullish uh, configuration. It's not to say that you don't want to keep an eye on uh, those sort of measures. I think you definitely do. Final observation here to finish up our segment, uh, banking on breadth. The bullish percent index on the S&P is back above 70%. Again, when you think about what would change, a change of character, 
This getting back below 70%, I'm wondering if maybe this reinitiation of the overbought condition uh, last week, maybe we're waiting for another sell signal there. Uh, this last sell signal did not work particularly well. The market just moved right above there, even though the bullish percent index came below 70%. I'm going to continue to watch this one. When it breaks below, I'll certainly let you know. And that could be an indication that there's more of a broader pullback happening. For now, breadth conditions fairly robust. Folks, that's a wrap for the show. Let's get to the three in three, three charts in three minutes that tell the story of this market environment. Here is chart number one. You know, we talk about our segment banking on breadth. And again, hopefully you got the message. Breadth conditions are fairly strong. And I would argue they've improved uh, in the last uh, two to three weeks. Sort of that mid-January to mid-February time frame, it looked like things might be a little different because we saw breadth trending downwards as the S&P was trending higher. And that's really what you saw in January after the December peak. But look at how all of those things have improved. The bullish percent index has turned back higher. The percent of stocks above their moving averages has turned back higher. The AD line for the New York Stock Exchange made a new 52-week high here in the last week. So when the S&P, when the NASDAQ, when the AD lines are making new 52-week highs, the trend is positive and the breadth is just fine. Chart number two, looking at stocks versus gold. Shout out to our friend Miss Schneider of Market Gauge. She posted on uh, social media a chart that uh, encouraged me to look back at some ratios she was looking at, uh, I think, a different version of this chart, but I like to look at the SPY to GLD ratios. This is literally stocks versus gold. You know, we look at the S&P 500 on, on dollar terms, uh, basically, when we look at it in, uh, on a normal day-to-day -day basis. But looking at it relative to gold can help you understand whether soft assets like equities are doing better than hard assets like gold. Note how this ratio has turned lower. Now, this isn't because the S&P is turning down as much as it is because gold prices are rallying. And as a result, the SPY to gold ratio is turning lower. But that ratio continues to go lower. That could be a bit of a risk-off rotation, right? Um, because investors tend to want to own gold when they're nervous about owning other things. Gold tends to be a good store of value uh, over multiple decades, which is why it's a good way to ride through inflationary periods and other periods of market uncertainty. Keep an eye on that ratio to see if it continues to turn lower. Finally, a friendly reminder, as always, nothing good tends to happen below the 200-day moving average. The reason why I like to scan for stocks that are just above their 200-day moving average because it tells you it was able to do what Brown Foreman Group was not able to do. BF slash B is the ticker for the Class B shares. That's what I tend to uh, look at here. We failed at resistance. We failed to get above a declining 200-day moving average. That is a sign of a stock still in a long-term distributive pattern, not a stock getting it done and getting enough of uh, buying power off of those lows. Folks, that is a wrap for the show. Thanks so much for joining us every weekday after the close for the final bar. We have some great guests lined up for you here in the coming weeks. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe to our channel. You won't miss some of the great guest conversations we're going to have. For Stock Charts and Redmond Washington, I'm Dave Keller. Be well, stay safe, have a good night.